<laughs> He's like posing, posing. Yeah. It's my good side. Hi, everyone. So I am here with Jay Elaine. She is an animal lover by calling and a professional vet assistant by trade with over a decade in experience in the veterinary or profession. Sorry. <laughs> uh, Jay decided to create a way to help you avoid the costly mistakes pet parents make. Um, time and time again. So through her work, she sets out to empower pet parents through breaking down complex veterinary topics into easy to navigate topics so that they can make an informed decision about their pet's health and well-being. So thank you, Jay, for joining. Um, so do you mind just starting off telling us a little bit about yourself? I know we, I just told everyone about you, but a little bit more and how you got started <laughs> as a veterinary nurse. Yes, I would love to. So, hey, everybody. Uh, my name is Jay again, like Lisa just said, and um, I actually got started in the field. I would say that my initial uh, intake was kind of like doing what most people do. Like I was a little bit of an explorer when I was younger. So I was that kid that was like digging in the dirt and looking at worms and looking at frogs and just messing with insects. And then it just turned into a much bigger um, thing when I started like rescuing animals off the side out of the road, turtles, like I'm stopping traffic so I can get turtles out of the middle of the road. Or I see like, uh, uh, I think we even, it was a squirrel, baby squirrel that was in the backyard one time and I rescued that and I learned about wildlife and I got into wildlife. So just several different avenues. But ultimately what I ended up doing was I was um, trying to break into the field for a very long time and I just wanted to do anything. So that was kennel, um, assisting or whatever I could do. If I could just sweep floors, um, whatever I could do to get in. And then I actually got my first start at a hospital. It was a very um, affordable care based hospital. And we used to see a lot of very basic um, like, like parvo cases and things like that. Um, but it was kind of like a affordable care. So it was a harder space of medicine um, because you have people that have a harder time with that barrier um, to being able to treat their pets and things like that. So it was a very interesting job to kind of jump into, um, but that's kind of what initially sparked everything in me um, to want to kind of get on this platform and everything. And I kind of just built from there and I started to get into um, emergency and I got into specialty medicine. And I all still to this day, I continue to do general practice as well. Um, but currently I'm a relief technician, so I get to do a little bit of everything. So that's really fun. Yeah. So I know like, I'm just wondering what is like your biggest frustration with pet parents? Cause I know for me, like as a dog trainer, it can be frustrating sometimes when you give everyone the tools and everything and they, uh, you know, don't practice or they don't really implement everything. Or another example is people get a puppy not knowing anything about dog training or puppy training and they don't spend any time trying to learn either. So that's kind of like, my frustration. I'm sure you come across a ton in your profession as well. So from a more like health perspective, what is your biggest frustration? Um, I would <laughs> say that my biggest frustration, um, so I always like to distinguish for people because there's a, I have personal views and then I have professional views. So because it's one of the things that you have to do in space is that you have to be empathetic. Uh, the reality is that when we go into a room with people and we are meeting them for the first time or they come in regularly, whatever the case may be, we only have a short period of time to really teach people all the things that they need to know. So it requires a lot of independent work. So having clients actually go out and seek the information and get more information and we give them resources and things like that, that's a lot harder for people because if you think about it like us, you know, we have lives outside of our professions. And when we get into different things, like let's say we have kids or um, we have pets as well. Um, but let's say we had kids and we go into the doctor and the doctor's telling us different things about our kids, but they're overwhelming us with so much information. And it can be overwhelming to clients and they don't remember everything because this is not their this is not their specialty. This is not their field. So I don't expect them to know everything. However, um, when you take on a pet, you're taking on this responsibility to make sure you're doing the best care for the pet. Right. And I think the biggest stigma um, that people get is that it's so expensive and it's not it's not not true. 
Um, the reality is that in, in when we're talking about veterinary medicine versus human medicine, veterinary medicine, we don't have what we have in human medicine to the extent of you know, insurance and things like that, right? So we have veterinary insurance, like there's, there's insurance out there, but the insurance, they're not all equal. They don't have any rules right now. They have no regulation on the insurance. So pretty much they can do whatever they want to do. They don't have to do, they, they don't have set principles that they have to abide by in order and in, in order to take your money every single month, you know? So what I tell people is that, you know, it's, we have to charge a certain amount of money because we're providing a service. When you provide a service, there's a cost for that service. Now in, in human medicine, you're going to see, you're not going to see as much of that because you have the insurance. So they're paying for all of those things and you're pretty much paying like a copay or you may pay a small percentage or something like that. But in veterinary medicine, you're seeing the whole cost up front and you know, like, okay, all you know at the end of the day is that you're pissed sick and you have a thousand dollar bill. How did I get a four thousand dollar bill? And it doesn't matter when we sit here and we explain all the things to you. you. Want to know why does it cost so much? Well, think about blood work machines. Like an average blood work machine is like, you know, over a hundred k. So if I if we're running blood work or radiograph machines, those are hundreds of thousands of dollars. So when we're doing X-rays on your pet or we're doing an ultrasound, we're doing blood work or whatever the case may be, it's very, 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 very costly to us, and we have to be able to afford not only the facility, but the equipment within the facility. And then we also have to um, uh, afford the employees that are in the facility. And I don't and I don't think that people mean it to be harsh and I don't think people mean it to be aggressive or anything like that. I just think that there is a lack of understanding and knowledge there because you don't know the back end. All you know is that your pet is sick and we're charging you all this money to try to make your pet better. Um, so I can understand it from both. That's why I say I have a personal opinion and then I have a professional opinion because professionally I've had people get as upset as to spit on me. And personally, I've, you know, I sit and I might do a little bit more than the average technician. Like I'll go and I'll sit down and I'll have a conversation with you. Like, you know what, like I show you the bill, but I'm like, okay, let's sit down and let's break this down line by line because I want you to understand what I'm doing and why I'm doing it. And I think a lot of times when clients, you know, when clients understand what it is that we're teaching or that what, what we're trying to do, like, why do you need to run blood work? What does the organ function tell you? What does the blood function tell you? What does it mean when I'm going to do an ultrasound on your pet? What does it mean when I'm doing x-rays on your pet? I think the biggest thing and the biggest barrier to kind of break that down is to talk to our clients and educate our clients and take the time out and treat them like a person. Um, I know in the veterinary field, a lot of times we can get frustrated, like professionally, I can get frustrated because I have clients that bring their pets in at the end. And I'm like, you, your pet's been sick for weeks and now you've brought them into me and you want me to do something to fix it. And I can't fix it at this point without doing these. I have to, first off, I have to know what's going on. I can't just look at your pet and say, this is what's wrong with them. Let's go ahead and fix everything. That's not how it works. We have to have a, we have to have a starting place. And everything in medicine is about diagnostics because we have to understand what's going on internally to understand what's, what, why you're feeling the symptoms or the signs that you're feeling. So um, that would be my biggest I would say the biggest frustration would be um, that it's expensive, um, but unpacking that is like it, it's a lack there of communication and understanding and empathy. But I think it's from both sides. I wouldn't say it's just from clients and I wouldn't say that it's just from veterinary professionals. I think we both have to find a way to communicate a little bit better. I tell people um, when I go in my room, like people laugh because I can just go somewhere and just talk to people. I have no problem with it, but it's because I talk to clients so much because part of meeting your clients and getting a building a relationship with your clients is there's that that dating phase. Like I date my clients. I go in and I have to win them over. I have to make them trust me. I have to like there you have to build a rapport with them so that they know that you're there for their pet. And that's all I'm there for at the end of the day. I promise I don't see most of that money. <laughs> but you know, I'm there because I'm passionate about what I do and I want your pet to be taken care of. <laughs> Um, I want your pet to be taken care of and, um, you know, we get whatever we need to get done at the end of the day. That's all I care about. So. Yeah. And actually someone just commented, um, the vets always try to push medication instead of herbal healing though, is what they yeah. said. Um, yeah. And that's, yeah. that's, that's a, and I'm just going to address it really quick just so they can. Um, so I think people have to understand that when you think about what, 
where human medicine was and then where it has gotten. And then you think about animal medicine. So I've been in the field over a decade now. So it's where I was when it first started to where it is now is different. It's way different than it was 10 years ago. 10 years ago, most people didn't even take their pets to the vet. Like 20 years ago, what's a vet? So it's 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 constantly growing and it's constantly changing. Now, there are um, veterinarians that have a more holistic approach. They exist, um, but you have to seek them out. Um, and, and, you know, when it comes to the mindsets of most veterinarians, it's just like a human doctor. We're very science based. When we're in school and we're learning the trade and things like that, like I'm going to school to be a veterinarian, I apply um, next year. But, you know, this year, while I'm still doing the nursing aspect of things, I will tell you, like, because I have to take those classes right now while I'm working towards the um, uh, program. It's science based. Everything is science based. They don't teach us the holistic approach. They don't teach you how food can heal. They don't teach you how being fit and active and mental stimulation and mental fitness. They don't teach you all of those things in veterinary school. They teach you medicine and um, physiology of an animal. And, um, you know, if we talk about nutrition, it's like really basic, like what are the right dog foods? What are the right cat foods and what needs to be in the, it's more so what needs to be in the food, like carbohydrates, minerals, um, proteins, uh, things like that. That's what they teach you. They don't teach you the holistic approach. Um, so I think understanding that, but also you have to recognize some people aren't there yet. Like, you know, a long time ago, we used to think that we just needed medicine for everything. And now people are understanding that what you put in your body, as well as the things that you surround yourself with, are all playing into your health as a human being, right? So it's the same thing with animals. The veterinarians have to get there. They're just not there yet, unfortunately. Most of them, not all of them. Um, there are exceptions to the rules, definitely. But I will say a lot of them, they're not there yet. Yeah. And speaking of that, I feel like there's just so much misinformation on the internet or at least mm -hmm. like conflicting information, right? Like you'll see someone recommend a raw diet, which actually I feed my dogs half raw, half kibble, just because raw is very expensive. Yeah. <laughs> um, but, yeah. you know, on the internet, there's so, number one, there's misinformation, but number two, there's also like conflicting information. So mm -hmm. what is the best way to navigate that? What do you recommend as far as um, where people should be getting their information from? And that's like, that's the slippery slope, right? So whenever it comes to, you know, the correct information, I always tell you that I'm always going to say the golden standard is a veterinary professional because that's, this is what we do. Um, now, a lot of us take that extra step and we try to get that holistic background as well. So when I talk about holistic, I talk about uh, holistic is a combination of different types of medicine. And that might be um, more natural um, approaches or it may be like the traditional standards of medicine where you, you know, I prescribe you this medication and then let's do this and that's it. Um, so holistic is just the umbrella of medicine in general. So it's different um, ways of reaching your end goal. Um, so I like the holistic approach. I think that there's times where medicine has to kind of step in, but I also think that there's most of the time, if you actually are implementing things before they get to a point <laughs> where they have an issue, like the proactive approach, which is what I teach, um, then that's when you're going to be able to kind of, um, I guess, navigate it a little bit better. Um, when you're when it comes to the information and where you get it from, again, I would say a veterinary professional, but it's it's specific to the type of veterinary professional. So there are veterinary nutritionists, um, and I have a few that I actually recommend, like in my course, which we'll talk about later. Um, I do when I teach you about different things. I'm teaching you the foundation. I'm not teaching you how to actually feed a raw diet. I'm teaching you why, what the different types of diets are. And then I want you to make a decision based off of the information that I give you. Uh, so I have a very unbiased viewpoint when it comes to all of this stuff. Um, like personally, do I have a view? What do you think? Do I feed my dogs? I mean, my cats and then my parents' dog. And I mean, what do I recommend to people a homemade diet? If that's cooked or if that's raw, that's completely up to you. But for me, I cook my pets. Um, You froze for me. Are you still there? Hold on, let me see what is 
going on? Do do do. Can you hear me? <laughs> Everything froze for me. Let's see. Okay, hey, hey, I'm still live. Hello, everybody. Okay, hi. Sorry, I don't know what happened. It, everything <laughs> froze for me. Were you able to hear me? <laughs> I was just like, I couldn't hear you. It, I knew you said hold on, but it's good. It's fine. <laughs> okay, sorry. <laughs> Keep going. <laughs> so, oh, I forgot my train. It left the station. Um. Oh, yes. So the professionals you should seek out. I mean, for veterinary, I would always say a veterinary professional. There's veterinary nutritionists. There's veterinarians that actually teach holistic, uh, or not necessarily holistic, but they they have a holistic background. Um, there's several of them that are. It, it's one on Instagram. I wish I knew that her name. Um, I'll send that information to you though, because I can't think of of it off the top of my head. But um, most veterinarians that are like a nutritionist and they they teach like raw diets and home diets and stuff like that. They can they typically know somebody to refer you to for if you want like medicine in general, like uh, a holistic doctor. They can they have they have those networks because that's what they tend to work in. The second thing that I'm going to say to back that up is that whenever you're talking about um, finding somebody that might be um, like holistic or a veterinary nutritionist or whatever the case may be, um, I would always say to make sure that you're connecting your doctors together. Um, now, I tell people to get a veterinary professional because most veterinarians are only going to talk to another veterinarian. They don't want to talk to somebody that is not necessarily like a veterinary nutritionist. Um, about your pet's diet. That's not because it's just how it is, frankly. I, I it's just how they are. I, I don't really have a, you know, it, it, and I an excuse for it or a <laughs> walk a workaround for it. But if you are, I tell people to look for a veterinary professional because most veterinarians will listen to a veterinary professional, but who they won't listen to is somebody that's not like credentialed and licensed and things like that. So that's just. Unfortunately, that's just that uh, a bit another barrier. But if you do consult with a nutritionist or sorry, you do consult with a holistic veterinarian, definitely make sure that you connect those veterinarians so they have your pet's information and they kind of know what's going on with your pet. Um, so that's all the thing with that. Yeah. And um, someone said, I think more people need to go into the vet industry to get a certification, but be more in the holistic part. Because pharmaceutical yeah. medication is killing pets because it is against nature. And yeah, like I, I think mm -hmm. there's more and more, um, like you said, holistic vets. Like I see them online and the yep. Dogs Naturally magazine, Whole Dog Journal, they all yep. talk a lot about like holistic stuff. And I agree with you, mm -hmm. like exactly what you said. Like there is a, um, like a place for pharmaceutical. Like if your dog is about to, it like has parvo like at that point yeah it's kinda, yeah. It's that it, again, it can, yeah it tends to be the more yeah. extreme cases like leptospirosis parvo heat stroke like you want at that point you want me to intervene with medicine because if i don't your pet it's like when they're at the break of like okay if we don't intervene with medicine they're gonna die um <laughs> so it you know yeah. unfortunately it gets to that point but again and what I tell people when you're talking about a holistic approach, holistic tends to be a part of a whole lifestyle journey. It's not just a, okay, well, let me go and get some, my pet all of a sudden is having diarrhea. Let me go and get like holistic medications to cure the diarrhea. Um, and then it's bloody stool at that point, you know? So, you know, there's certain medications when it gets to like bloody stools and stuff like that, you have to use them, unfortunately. So making sure that we're trying to combat that by making certain choices every single day from the food that you feed to how your pet is active and the type of treats that you give of and um doing like when you leave the house every day what are you supposed to be they just kind of leave their pets at home and hope for the best and you know because yeah. when they don't have something to do that's when they get into trouble so yeah. Um, and I was part of this group for a really long time on Facebook. I had to actually leave because it was really upsetting for me. Um, it was like a Ask a Vet Facebook group. I don't know if you've heard of it, but people would post things all the time like, oh, do you have any natural solutions for my dog that um, has been throwing up all night and, mm -hmm. you know, like has bloody diarrhea? Um, 
Yeah. You yeah. know, like all this stuff like that was like in line with Parvo because their dog was like nine weeks. And they're, and I was just like, I saw the comment like that post like a day later and then I looked at the comments and they're like, unfortunately she passed away. And I was just like, it was like these posts all the time. And I was like, I have to leave this group. Like I can't handle this. Like, I don't know. And then I always like to compare it to, it's like, you know, if you were to have, like if someone has a heart attack, like, at that point, you can't be like, you should eat vegetables and like <laughs> mm-hmm. go, you know, whatever. Um, yeah. Yeah. At that yeah. point, you have to have like a medical, like, intervention. Yeah, you have so I think to. Like, that you have a place to. for both. Oh, sorry. You cut out. What did you say? No, no, I said, you're right. You have to at that point. Um, like if you're like, for example, let's say um, I have a patient that comes in and they're vomiting, like your example, they're constantly vomiting. You can't keep anything down. How do you go about that with a holistic approach when you can't like there's injections that we give for as an anti-nausea that stop them from vomiting so that you can get food into them and you can get the nutrients into them and it stay there. So, you know, again, there's a time that you have to use medicine. Um, and then there's a time where you can kind of, and then there, you know, most of the time you probably can get around it, but when it gets to the point where you have to use medicine, you just have to use it. And, you know, if you're using sparingly and you're not using it all the time, all the time, all the time, um, that's when people have issues when they're like, constantly on something. Um, Same thing in human medicine, like when you're forever on a heart medication, then you might start to have other organ issues because you've constantly been on that heart medication or, you know, so on blood pressure pills, um, liver supplements, things like that. There's always some type of secondary um, effect or impact that's going to happen to you because of that medication. So leading a lifestyle where you're pretty much making sure that you're combating those things. Like you have to be active. You have to be eating right. You have to be doing all of these things to make sure that you can kind of um, eliminate some of that stuff. You know, some stuff you can't eliminate like cancers and things like that, because sometimes cancer isn't necessarily caused by what you're eating. Um, It could be something that's genetically um, imposed onto your pet or you as a person. Um, so you can't always beat all of those things, but definitely trying to combat things with a more healthy lifestyle is ideal in most cases. Yes. Um, so I don't know if you want to talk a little bit more about your like course and your membership program about how people, um, you know, can be more proactive, and then maybe just talk about like what inspired you to even like create your course and membership. Yeah. So um, I I would say um, I do have two courses. Um, I was the first one is a membership based one, and the second one is like just a single course. So the membership one is more so built on the idea of maintenance. Um, and then my boot camp course is actually like the getting you started course. Um, and in the future, I have a big course that's going to kind of cover everything. And I'll talk about that one last. Um, so the membership course is where people can come in and they can get uh, started, you know, because I wanted different barriers for people, because one of the things that I have is that most people have an issue with is um, the financial aspect of things. And I know that that can be hard because um, I know in my own lifestyle, I'm a student and I'm a veterinary Uh, again, assistant, and we just don't get paid much. So when it comes to being able to maintain my pets and stuff like that, you have to have a system or um, some type of strategy for all of those things. So um, implementing something that made sure that pretty much everybody could get into it was important for me. So that's why I created the membership. Um, Now in the membership, I basically have um, several different sections um, where I talk about like, um, I have a section that talks about like food and stuff like that, but I also have a section uh, that talks about like preventative care and maintenance of your pet and um, several other aspects. But I actually do a lot of how to's. I do a lesson every single month. And then I have like a live stream where people will come on and I'll actually have different conversations and people can do a and a with me if they do have questions or they do need um, kind of help navigating different issues with their pets. Now I can't give you necessarily medical advice. However, I can tell you um, which route you need to take next and um, just kind of how to navigate and um, things that you can do to kind of help you prevent certain things as well. Um, so that's what that um, section is all about. And it's about $30. It's, what is it? Yeah, it's $30 a month. 
um, for the membership program. And then I have the boot camp, which is actually going to officially launch next month. But I went ahead and um, opened up early access for some of your um, followers so they can actually hop in and they can take a look at everything and kind of see what they think and everything of that. Um, but the boot camp course is kind of a mini course. It's um, about nutrition, fitness, and lifestyle. So it's basically to transition your mind set from a reactive mindset to a proactive mindset. So you get in there and um, I hit the ground running with nutrition and I talk about the biology aspect of everything, what's balanced in a diet, basically what goes into a diet and why it goes into a diet for your pet. We talk about support, like how to find people to help you to create the best diet for your pet. Because initially I always tell people, if you're going to make your pet's food, be it raw, cooked, whatever you want to do, if you want to make your pet's that space because you can really harm your pet by not doing the proper care on your pet. So that's the first thing that I would say. Um, and then for the, you know, for the second section fitness, I talk about like physical fitness, mental fitness. I'm going to grab my court really quick because it's saying that my um, computer is going to go off. So give me one sec. Yeah. And I'll just answer this question really quick. So um, someone asked what kind of course dog training or vet training. Um, so Jay's is going to be more about proactive care for your pet. And I think you do touch a little bit on like socialization and stuff, right? But it's going to be more about like the holistic overall view for your for your dog. Yeah. So the big, the big course is actually going to be about um, kind of everything. That's the next one that I'm going to talk about. This boot camp is a little, it's a little bit um, shorter lived. It's not really a it's not my all invasive like jam packed because it's so hard to implement everything that I want to implement. Um, so the boot camp it goes into fitness too, and it talks about like um, the importance of like mental fitness and then physical fitness with your pet, and then it gives you ideas of what you should be doing with your pet past just walking and um, stuff like that. It's like it really goes into a little bit more in depth of what you should be doing um, with your pet, and then the lifestyle section talks about like how to structure your home for your pet, um, giving them like a home home base as I like to call it. Um, and then it talks about like um, structure. On, um, to get your pet started. Active versus reactive lifestyle. So I give you a formulation and then I kind of tell you um, how to get started with all that. I touch on insurance and I also touch on um, budgeting and stuff like that as well in that course. Um, so that's what that course is about. Now, the big course that I'm going to make is called the Empowered Pet Parent. That's going to be launching, what month is this? This is March. April's coming up. May. So May, the Empowered Pet Parent course is going to be launching. That course is the jam pack one. That's probably the one that most people are going to want to get into. Um, I say that the boot camp is kind of like a jump start but you really want to get into the empowered pet parent because what that one does, I talk about the cardiovascular system. I'm going to talk about the digestive system. Um, that's more of the like science. And then it also gets into, um, you know, like preventative care, like vaccinations versus titers, um, euthanasia, um, end of life conversations, emergencies. What do you do in an emergency? How to set up a first aid kit, how to do like all of that type of stuff will be in that course. So that's kind of like the big one um, that most people, when they ask me different questions and stuff like that, that'll be in that course. So um, yeah. Which by the way, um, Jay included, thank you so much. You included a pet first aid PDF for everyone. And it's in, so this is streaming in like a few places. So it's on YouTube and on Facebook, but it's oh. in the Facebook group because there's no way to really <laughs> upload it as a file onto YouTube. So I included the link on YouTube to the Facebook group. But anyway, it's in there and it's a pretty useful tool just to have like, it'll list off kind of what you need for your first aid kit. And yeah, thanks for um, sharing that. And yeah, um, Someone said a lot of food in the market has corn, soy, and fillers. Yep. It is hard to find good food for them. That's why they're getting sick too. I totally agree with that. And yep. even like I still feel guilty because I do feed half kibble still. <laughs> and I feed open farm. So it's technically, you know, it's so hard to read like labels and stuff. But open farm, they say mm -hmm. they cook it at a lower temperature. So it's like not as carcinogenic and there are less fillers in it. But I still am unhappy that <laughs> I'm feeding half kibble. But, you know, it's, um, eventually. So one of the things one of the things that my um, nutritionist that I work with, um, when so when you go into the uh, boot camp course that I have up um, that everybody has a link to, 
that course, I actually have nutritionists that I recommend you to. It's three different ladies and they have three different approaches. Um, and I picked these ladies because I wanted something that was reasonable for people that you can actually achieve because people have different standards. Like some people are like that, that parent that is, you know, they do what their pet needs. Um, and that's pretty much it. And then you have that pet parent that's like, okay, I do what my pet needs. And then sometimes I want to really spoil them. And then that's like kind of the middle range pet parent, right? And then you have that pet parent that's just over the top and they do absolutely everything and some. Um, so, and then, so I have something for them too. So um, again, I have a veterinary nutritionist. So she's a veterinarian that's a nutritionist. Um, I have some women that are actually trained in um, veterinary nutrition as well. And um, one of them is really good with like cats, like sphinx and things like that. Some of the more specialized pets, um, but they have a holistic whole line like ear cleaner, shampoos, um, like different, some, some are supplements and just all kinds of stuff. And she's great. And her name's April. Um, and she actually has a following um, as well. And she teaches all, she teaches like holistic stuff and like essential oils and April does everything. So I love her for that. So when I have people that are more like holistic approach and things like that, then I kind of send them to April. And then when I have people that more so want to like enhance the diet or they want to get started in like a raw diet or whatever the case may be, I send them to, um, Savannah. And Savannah's my other one. It's like kind of like enhance the diet. If you can't do a whole raw diet, then you can enhance their diet, kind of what you're doing. Like you feed them a little bit of kibble and you also feed them the raw diet as well. There is nothing wrong with that. And I, I, that's, that's what upsets me, you know, in this space, especially with different people that want to come in and they kind of just look at people and they have this automatic judgment. And that frustrates me beyond words, because the reality is that not everybody can reach you know, and do the most. Not everybody, not everybody can do that. And I'm one of those people that can't do the most. And I don't feel bad that I can't do the most because the reality is you can only do what you can do. And yeah. to make you feel guilty for trying to do your best to take care of your pet is absolutely ridiculous to me. Um, and it's just not okay. Um, so that's my, um, you know, opinion on that. So when it comes to enhancing your pet's diet or giving the best diet that you can, you got to figure out what works best for you. And then I have another, um, in April, um, the other one that I told you has like a whole line. She has a supplement that you can actually, um, she teaches you how to make their food like piece by piece and how to prep it. But she also teaches you like how to just add the supplementation. So you don't have to buy all the different stuff to put into their food. And it's all in one packet and you just measure it out and you put it in the food. Oh my gosh, it's amazing. It's so simplified. It doesn't have to be dramatic. It doesn't have to be hard. It can just be something where you make your pet's food, you vacuum seal it, and then it's there for storage and you can make months of food and then you just unthaw it and you feed it to them, be it raw or cooked. She has two different packs, like one's for raw food, one's for cooked because one has like bones and stuff like that in it if you don't, if you like cook your food or whatever. But um, she's really good about that. So that's one of the things that I have in the course that I, that's why I tell people, you know, boot camp is good to get you started. And honestly, if you get started with a boot camp, you pretty much don't have to take like my bigger course unless you really want to know science and you really want to understand like, you know, what's going on with them when it comes to um, that cardiovascular system, when an emergency is happening, what what does it mean when an emergency is happening and my pet, my pet goes in a cardiac arrest? What does that mean? Like people want to know that stuff. And um, they ask me those questions and they, you want to be able to have a conversation with your veterinarian and you want to be able to read blood work. Like I teach you how to read blood work. I teach you what the different functions are on that blood, on that piece of paper. So, you know, when your vet's going over things, oh, okay, so this is what an electrolyte function is for. This is what the ALT is. This is what the um, BUN is or creatinine or whatever the case may be on the blood work. I want you to know how to read those things and how to understand those things. So you, so people basically can't get over on you because that's an approach. Some people they have veterinarians that they've had an experience and they feel like their veterinarian took advantage of them because they did not know what was going on and they were just trusting their opinion. Um, that's, that's the purpose of that course. So I can kind of teach you a little bit of everything so that you can make your own decisions for your pet and you don't feel like you're limited. Now I'm saying, I'm not saying that it's going to replace your veterinarian. It can't replace your veterinarian because four years of education, you know, are really, we go to school for like eight years, <laughs> but eight years of education can't be replaced with one course. Um, so it's not, that in depth, but it's in depth to the point where you're going to understand how to do certain things. If your dog starts all of a sudden bleeding, like they burst through a window. I've had that happen like several times. Um, the dog burst through the window and they like lacerated themselves and they're just bleeding because um, something's open and I, teaching you how to like put pressure on it and wrap it so that you can get them to the vet. Those are the types of things that 
I'm trying to teach people and I'm trying to help people to understand. Um, the hard part is that sometimes people do things and they take it too far and they try to treat their pets on their own and then they cause more of an issue. Um, so, you know, it's bittersweet, <laughs> but I it, the information has to be out there and it needs to be the correct information so that people aren't causing harm to their pets and they have a little bit better of an understanding of what to do. So, um, yeah, to navigate that, definitely think <laughs> I see King Yorkie official says she's definitely over the top. I love it. I have no problem with that. Um, I love all pet parents. Anybody that takes on a pet to me is an awesome person. And um, I just want to help you to do to do the do everything that you can within your power um, when it comes to helping your pet. Like, when is it time to go see a specialist? When is it time to see, um, go to the ER? What's an emergency? I teach you how to get vitals on your pets and all of that. All of that stuff is inside of my big course that's coming out, but it's in the membership. I even put it in the membership because I think that it's important so that people can go in and they can kind of find some of that information out. I don't want to ever have, like, if I could, I would just give everything away for free. And um, the problem with that is when I try to give things away for free and I try to take the time out to just teach people and everything, they don't really do it. And I think it's because they haven't invested anything into it because it's free. Yeah. Right? Oh my God. So I have to make sure I have a barrier to get into it. Yeah. And of course, that's not like every mm -hmm. single person, but it's actually really funny because when I first started my own business outside of, so I used to work for another company as a dog trainer. And then when I started my own business, I did a group on just to get like the initial people in and it was super, super cheap. I was just, I was also trying to get my hours for my certification. And I think it was like $20 mm -hmm. for like a one hour in-person session, like for me to come to your house, like that's so cheap. And I was only getting $10 of that $20, but I was doing it, like I said, um, for my hours yeah, and to get from, like my initial group. <laughs> but I swear to God, like none of those, first of all, none of them used all of them, which ended up working out for me, I guess. But it's also like you have 10, it was 10 sessions. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, you only, most of them only use like three of them because they were like not invested. And then, <laughs> and then on top of that, none of them like practiced. I even had people that bought it and then mm -hmm. never like they they um did the initial 30 minute console and then never used any of it. I was like, that's so expensive. You just paid like I mean, just for like a quick, like free console. Like, I don't know, it was it was crazy, but it was a really good learning experience for me. And you know, out of all the people that bought it, I mean, there were still people that actually took it seriously and like, you know, really practiced and stuff, but it was like out of like 30 people, it was like two, you know what I mean? <laughs> that actually like, did it. Yep. And when I started actually charging like a normal certified dog trainer amount, um, it's mm -hmm. crazy because the amount of people that actually take it seriously is like so different. So it is true. Like even for me, like if I sign up for like a free webinar, I'm like, oh, I forgot. But if it's like something that I paid for, even if it was like a hundred dollars or $50 or hundred dollars, I'm like, okay, I paid, I'm going to go. <laughs> so I, yeah, yeah. I totally um okay so we have we do another question so um someone asked what is truly the best health insurance for dogs what's the best course of action or a way for me to prepare a vet for a highly anxious pup against strangers which i can actually touch on that too um and then they said i can't imagine it'll be that different uh with the vet so it's kind of like two questions so let's first start with the okay. health insurance <laughs> okay. Um, so for health insurance, that's a loaded question. <laughs> so again, um, like we talked about earlier, I don't know if this person's been here the whole time. <laughs> so there's no regulation on pet insurance right now. So they can kind of, they have free range to kind of do whatever it is that they want to do and create what they want to create and not cover things that they don't want to cover. So most insurances, um, they range from from uh, a catastrophic plan to like a catastrophic and wellness plan. So there's some that are just wellness, there's some that are catastrophic and there's some that are a combination of both. Um, so there's tier one, two and three. So if we're talking about like, it depends on what you want as far as um, coverage for your pet. Um, so I'll talk about insurances and then I'm gonna talk about what some veterinarians have independently in their hospitals. These are more so like chains and corporations and things like that. So as far as the actual pet insurances, personally, I have Trupanion, um, but let me tell you why I have Trupanion. Um, so I have Trupanion because Trupanion has something that not all the other veterinarian um, insurances have, and that's they have Vet Direct. So Vet Direct is where they pay your veterinarian directly and you just cover the difference. Um, that is the only thing that I like that made a difference 
from me with Trupanion. Um, now, the other thing that most insurances all have in common and how they're going to get most people is that if you have anything pre-existing on your pet, if it ever says, like, let's say your pet later on down the road, you have insurance and they, um, you get insurance and then, um, they have allergies or something like that. Okay. You take them to the, you want to take them to the dermatologist. You want to do all the extreme things and just kind of figure out what the allergy is too. Is it to food? Is it to environment? What exactly is going on with my pet? Um, they're going to, if you have anything that was before the coverage that says, oh, patient has like, I remember a client came in and said like patient has a whisper of alopecia on their record from like when it was a puppy and it went away. They never had issues again and they still counted it as pre-existing so they wouldn't cover it. So, you know, I always tell people when you, yeah, it's ridiculous. When you get a pet and you get them on insurance, like immediately get them on insurance. If you're going to get insurance, just, just get it when they're puppies. Get it when they're puppies. You have no issues. If the if you if because if you go in and you have anything like let's say they ate something in the past and they had a foreign body in the past and then you had insurance and they get a foreign body five years down the road, they're not going to cover it because it's pre-existing. So always in the beginning, the best practice for any insurance that you get is to get it in the beginning when they're puppies or before they have any type of issue. Um, if you switch veterinarians or whatever, get it then and then start your history then. Whatever route you want to take, but just make sure that they don't have anything pre-existing when you get the policy. Um, because they're going to ask for old records from your pet um, all the way from the beginning when they first got shots, all of that stuff. So just keep in mind all of those things um, whenever you're shopping insurances. Now, um, when you, if you have exotic animals, the only insurance that there is for exotic animals is nationwide. Um, when we're talking about domestic animals like dogs and cats, um, there's several different ones. There's Pets Best, there's Embrace, there's Trupanion, there's Nationwide. Um, Nationwide has a wellness program. I think Embrace has a wellness program. I think um, Nationwide has a yeah wellness program and Catastrophic. Um, they kind of do everything. Um, Trupanion is the only one that's pretty much catastrophic. They don't really do anything that is um, wellness based. Um, so again, I it's it's research. It's it's going in, doing the research, looking at what your coverage is going to be every single month. I will tell you, Trupanion, they raise rates every single year. Also keep that in mind. Um, I think my pets last year, they were at like 26 and now it's at like 33 or something like that. Um, yeah. It's a little, it's more expensive. So you it goes up. up every single yeah. year. So if it's going up by like uh, 10, 12 percent every single year, think about what that's going to be. Start doing the calculations. Look at your budget. I always tell people the best the best practice is just to have a budget for your pet and set that set money aside. Even if you don't go to the vet, you know when your pet is going to go to the vet yearly. OK, so, you know, they go once a year at least. So most people go twice a year, but some people go once a year. It just depends on what age your pet is. So, you know, if you're going to get a puppy, you need to start creating a budget or a kitten or whatever bird, whatever you want to get you know, you need to start setting up a budget and savings for that pet. It's just like a kid. I'm telling you, it's just like a kid. Start saving yep. a set, um, start setting up a savings plan. The next thing you want to do is to every single month, whatever you spend, like make sure you have a budget for their food and then for an emergency or whatever, every single month that should be in your budget. And then you want to make sure that you set something up that also has their, um, it has like their, uh, what, what was I going to say? Uh, yeah, yeah. So it has like their insurance or whatever. If you draw the insurance out every single month or you save it like it is insurance. So let's say your deduct your um, premium every single month is like you know, $32 a month. So you save $32 in that account every single month. Every single month you save that. And then um, if if you don't spend it, great. It just stays in the savings. You don't take this. You don't take it out of the savings. This is basic budgeting because some people don't know how to budget. Um, and I was one of those people. It's, I had to yeah. grow up. Um, so, you know, putting your money in every single month, um, and not touching that money. And so at the end of the year, when you know, you're going to take them into the vet, that's money that you can use towards the vet, or you can just keep it in there for the savings or whatever it is that you want to do. So I tell people just to set up something to where, you know, that you're going to have an emergency fund if something happens on average, um, to visit the veterinarian, um, for an emergency, it's about a hundred dollars. Um, that's pretty much across the board. Um, nationwide, I would say, not nationwide, um, as far as the U.S., um, Canada too, because I have some friends in Canada, um, and I've been in Canada to some veterinary hospitals, and they're about 100, 150, um, just depending on where you go for an emergency visit. Now, when you're talking about like blood work, x-rays, diagnostics, blood work on average is about um, 250 to 350, and x-rays are anywhere from four to 600. 
So just unless you're in LA, it gets expensive. Like to go in the door, it's like almost a grand, right? Just to get started. And then we have to do like medications and treatment and hospitalization or whatever it is after that. So people have to be realistic and understand like you got to save your money. So if you know that you have like a pure breed special pet or whatever, then you need to make sure that they you have a budget. And a, and a savings that reflects that because the bigger the pet is, the more expensive it is. And the more designer it is, the more expensive it is. So if you get a French Bulldog, understand French Bulldogs have like, they're brachiocephalic, which means they have like a shorter um, face. And they have things like like issues with their nares. So nares are like their nostrils. Um, they're very pinched and closed and like very narrow. So sometimes they have to have a surgery where they go in and they open it up a little bit so that they breathe a little bit better. And as far as like their soft palate in their mouth, they have to go in and sometimes create, uh, do a surgery where we um, elongate it because it's too um, short. So there's different types of things that happen with your cosmetic breed dog. Um, you know, it's, you know, I try not to get, I don't really care if people buy a dog. I'm not, I'm not one that's like, oh my God, that's so stupid. I don't care. I frankly don't care. If you want a specific dog or a pet or whatever, just know what you're getting into. Because the thing that I see a lot is that people buy these expensive pets and then they can't afford them. Like they buy this dog, they spent like $5,000 on the dog and then they come into me and the dog has parvo and they can't treat the parvo. Because all yep, the money went to buy the uh, pet. Where is it? Doodles. They have to get groomed every month or every six weeks. <laughs> <laughs> grooming, yeah, grooming is, grooming is expensive. Like people have to think about all these yeah. different. If you go on a trip, where's your pet gonna stay? Are you gonna get a pet sitter? Are you gonna take them to boarding? What are you gonna do? Like that's expensive. And on average, to board at a facility, it's like twenty five to like thirty five, forty bucks, depending on what size your pet is and what kind of um, what type of suite or cage or whatever you end up putting them in. Like it's oh my gosh, it's ridiculous. So um, and then if you have a bird, it's expensive for a bird. It's expensive for a cat. It's you have a freaking goldfish and you want somebody to come over and feed you goldfish while you're gone. That's expensive. It's like twenty dollars a visit. Like seriously, yeah. it's expensive. When you get these animals and you take on this, um, you take on this responsibility. You have to think about all those things. I'm so big about a budget for a pet. It's not even funny. Kids, yourself, you have to have a budget. Um, but when I going back to what I was talking about as far as the um veterinary hospitals, so hospitals like Banfield and I want to say um. We have several different ones here, Corner Vet, um, Thrive Veterinary um, yeah. Hospital, or Thrive of, of Affordable Care, that's what it's called. Um, it's several different ones, but um, I like Thrive. Um, Banfield, depends on the Banfield. It depends on it yeah. depends on the doctors. It depends on the staff. It depends on where you go. It's not that these corporations are bad. It's just that sometimes when people hire, they hire just whatever because that's what they can afford. Like they're paying, they're underpaying people because they don't want to pay the top dollar for the best. Um, and the more trained people, the poor and people that have like I have a BLS, I have an ALS, basic life support, advanced life support. Let me say what the words mean. Um, we do like fear free in some hospitals. Um, so when you have all those certifications and you know all of that stuff and you like somebody like me, I get paid a lot more money than the average veterinarian because I've done all of that work to learn all of that information and I'm working on a bachelor's and I'm my education is past that of a veterinary technician. But if you ask a veterinary technician, like, you know, what's a veterinary technician? They're typically licensed. Um, that's yeah. what a veterinary technician is. If you're not licensed, I, that's why I don't call myself a veterinary technician. I say I'm a veterinary professional because I think that it's important to make that, that um, distinguish the difference because people go in and they get their education and it's important that you get an education if you're going to be doing all of these things because you need to know what you're talking about and you need to know how to help people the right way um but um yeah they have a lot of plans within some of these corporations where it's like a um you pay a monthly fee and it's like a they try to sell it as insurance understand the difference it's not insurance it yeah. is a um, program specifically through that company and you pay like once a month and it's basically like you can go in for sick exams or however many exams you need within the year. You get like 10 to 20 percent off, depending on what the program is, 10 to 20 percent off of all services, um, excluding like um, I think like diagnostics and stuff like that. Everything else you get like 10 to 20, like medications and stuff like that, something like that. Um, everybody's different on how they do it. Everybody has a different idea and outlook and all that stuff. So I can't tell you um, what everybody does because I'm in Texas and Texas, the barrier is a little bit uh, lower than it is in like uh, Colorado, right? You're in Colorado, right, Lisa? Yeah. Colorado, it's a lot more expensive. My brother lives in Colorado. So I'm familiar with their prices too. I'm like, goodness. Um, so it's well, really 
it can be a little bit more expensive there. Um, versus the here. first, uh, the first emergency vet I ever went to, because I used, I'm from LA. That's why I was like, mm, an X ray yeah, on its own. And it was like in West LA. So it was like the most, you know, a more expensive part of LA too mm -hmm. that I took my dog to. I was a Ooh. brand new dog owner and he, all I did was switch his food too quickly and he threw up, but you know, I was brand new and I was like, oh, I was like, oh my God. So I like look online and they're like, it could be like upset stomach or it could be death. And I was like, ah, oh. so like I <laughs> that's the problem after Google, it will scare you. Like I know I, I'm guilty of it too, y'all. I get on, I get on Google and I'll Google stuff yeah. like, oh my gosh, like all of a sudden I have this migraine. Oh, you might have a brain yes. tumor. It's ridiculous. It's like, okay. For um, myself. So yeah. <laughs> yeah. So and, you know, and that's one of those examples where we're talking about like um, because some people think holistic is just like just natural alternatives to medicine that's not what holistic holistic is a whole branch of like different types of medicine it's all of it is what holistic is it's a whole approach um so the whole the natural um route that people want to take is like you can do like a pumpkin puree in their food and you know do like a bland diet of like chicken and pumpkin or something like that and a lot of times if they have an upset stomach due to like food or something like that it'll kind of balance itself out. But if it doesn't and they start breaking with like bloody diarrhea or something like that, they might have something like pancreatitis, um, which is inflammation of the pancreas. So it's something more extreme. So at that point you have to take them in, right? Cause it's getting worse. Yeah. Um, so I think people find figuring out like the balance between those two things. But if your pet's gums are like pale or, you know, they're having a hard time breathing or they um, are bleeding from somewhere or like stuff like that, that's an emergency. Um, yeah, you know, sure. vomiting one time is not necessarily an emergency, but if they're vomiting and they look lethargic and they're not breathing right and they're like all of these different things, then yeah, it's an emergency. Um, so I really want people to know, be able to distinguish the difference between those things as well. Um, which again, um, I did recently have, uh, I think it was last month in February, somebody asked me questions like this in the membership program and we talked about, um, all of that, but you know, it, it it's really, it's, it's, a hard space to navigate um, and figure out like what the best approach is um, for all of those things. But yeah, um, so for the insurance was a rant, um, but I hope that I answered uh, whoever's question yeah. that was. And then um, the second question that was part of the first question is, what's the best course of action or way for me to prepare a vet for my highly anxious pup against strangers? I can touch on that too. So number one is muzzle training so that Mu the muzzle isn't brand new when your dog gets there. I say every single dog and puppy should be muzzle trained. Not that you're going to always use it, but just so if there is a situation at a vet or somewhere where they have to wear a muzzle, if a dog is in a lot of pain, regardless of whether they're a nice dog or whatever, they're going to snap because they don't know why you're touching like, you know, their broken bone or whatever. Really so <laughs> you don't want like, the muzzle the first time to be when they're already stressed out. Like it should be like something that they're already used to. And you can do that through desensitization, peanut butter at the end of the muzzle. This is a very oversimplified version, but you can also look on YouTube for how to desensitize. Um, training a chin rest is also a great option so that they can rest their chin on your hand and start to desensitize them to being touched. Um, I went to uh, this online event called Clicker Expo and they had a bunch of sessions on just like, you know, getting them comfortable at the vet and husbandry, general husbandry stuff. But they were talking about also taking a syringe with no needle on it, obviously, because it's a syringe and like getting them used to just being like poked a little bit like in the butt so that if they can't handle that, they're not going to handle a needle. Right. So like desensitizing yeah. them as much as you can, taking them to the vet as much as you can pairing with lots of treats and yeah. And I'll let you add on too, from your point of view. <laughs> Are you still there? Yeah. So all those guys, obviously um, Lisa's the training professional. Um, so when it comes to my space, um, one of the things that I always tell people uh, whenever they have a pet that is anxious, the first thing I tell people to do when you're searching for a vet, and you may already have a vet, um, I'm just going to say this for everybody. Uh, when you're when you first get a pet, or when you're thinking about getting a pet, finding your veterinarian is like the first thing. I know people want to run to the store and get them, like all the cute outfits and the collars and the leashes and the beds and all that. So, uh -uh. I want you to go shop for a veterinarian. Um, so finding the right veterinarian is everything. 
You want somebody that is going to really make sure that you understand. They're going to take the time out with you. They're really going to um, make sure that when you leave, like, you know what's going on, you know what to do with your pet. And your support staff is everything as well. Like, I think a lot of people just look at the veterinarian, but they don't really get to know their support staff. You need to get to know the support staff as well. You need to know your receptionist. You need to know your technicians. You need to know your assistants. You need to know all the way down to the people that are in the cages. You need to know everybody because everything is a unit effort. And whenever there's an emergency or something with your pet, you want to take them somewhere where you know they're going to be cared for properly. And you want to be able to, if there's an emergency, I prefer to take my vet, my pet to the vet that I normally take them to and not to an emergency clinic if I can avoid it. Now, some hospitals are 24 seven, some hospitals have extended hours and some people are just general practice and that's it. And um, sometimes they can get them started but they can't do all of the emergency care. Um, so making sure that you know who they're comfortable with for emergency and stuff like that is also a conversation to have. Now, back to getting them prepared to go to the actual visit. Um, I'm gonna say seek out somebody that's fear free. Um, so I don't know if y'all know what fear free is. Um, I don't know if you know what fear free is, Lisa. Um, I do, but you can explain okay, so in, for everyone. Yeah, so in the veterinary field, um, I don't know if it's like pet care industry in general, but in the veterinary field, there's something called fear free. So fear free is where we take this approach to kind of help your pet navigate anxieties and stresses and fears whenever they go into the veterinarian. So what we do is it starts from when they first enter into the door. Um, some hospitals, they have like music playing, certain music playing that kind of helps your pet to relax and calms them. And then um, most veterinarians that are fear-free, they're going to have these hormones or these, they're not hormones, they're pheromones. Um, so pheromones are basically like a scent um, of their parent, like their mother. Um, so like a dog, it's the pheromones of a, a mother um, dog, or if it's a cat, it's pheromones of a mother cat. And they have these sensors, uh, I mean, these diffusers in all the rooms. So the cat room has cat stuff, the dog room has dog stuff, and that kind of calms them down as well. Then it goes into us actually coming into the room with your pet. If your pet's anxious, um, depending on what type of anxious, um, we kind of have to navigate you know, the situation when we get in there and figure out what's going on with your pet. Um, at home, what you can do is you can also get those same pheromone or, uh, pheromones, and they're called... Um, for cats, it's feel away. For dogs, it's a daftil. Uh, I will also send that to uh, Lisa so she has all the info. But there's diffusers, there's collars, there's sprays. Um, and there's like, they have all kinds of stuff now um, for those different companies. But feel away for cats and a daftil, A-D-A-P-T-I-L. A feel away is F-E-L-I-W-A-Y. Look at me, I can spell. Um, so those two things are um, the pheromones that kind of get them comfortable and get them um, okay with that. When you're first taking your puppy to the vet, I always tell people to kind of do a drive through. So you come yeah. in, you bring your pet, you let them take a couple of laps, um, let, let a veterinary technician take them, walk them to the back, um, let everybody in the hospital kind of love on them and stuff in the back, and then let them come back out um, and let them pass them to you. And then y'all just leave. Don't on a day where they're not going to get anything done, they're not going to poke them, they're not going to do anything to them so that they can go in and they can see like, okay, this is fine. This is not bad. This is okay. I feel comfortable. So that when they come back, they know that it's not automatically like a scary place. Yeah. Um, so, and, and I, I typically recommend people do that, not necessarily one time, but a few times if you can. If you can. Um, and then if you do have a pet that's very anxious going to the vet, I always tell people, bring them in for like um, a, a way in you know, like to make sure you're maintaining their weight and stuff like that. It, uh, it, two birds, one stone. So bring them into the vet, pop them on skull real quick, see what their weight is at. Um, we can give them like, if we know that your pet is sensitive and you bring them in and you let us know that you're coming, we'll like come up, we'll have some staff come up, we'll take them to the back, we'll walk them around. Um, with COVID and everything right now, we, won't, we, prob we, we haven't really been letting clients walk into the back. Yeah. and be around everybody as much, but we will take them to the back for you and we will take some laps with them and then we'll um, give them treats and stuff like that. And then we'll bring them back to you so that they can um, get comfortable to seeing us and getting comfortable with the team and getting comfortable with um, the environment and everything like that. So I think that that's really important as well. Um, and then the separation part. So when it comes to us coming into the room and we see like what type of um, anxious your pet is, some pe some pets do better without the pet parent because sometimes the clients are super anxious too. And yeah. they can feel, they can sense that when you're anxious. So when they can sense that you're anxious, then they get even more anxious. And it makes it harder for us to do the things that we need to do with them. 
Um, so what I like to do a lot of times is um, if they're really anxious and the pet parent is anxious, then uh, um, people will separate uh, the pet. I am a little bit different um, when it comes to like anxious pets and protective pets and stuff like that. I tend to come in and I sit in the room next to the client. I sit on the chair and I talk to the client for a little bit and they pet them and I pet on them and we kind of just get them comfortable and everything. I tend to do all my things in the room. If I can swing it, if I can get like their blood samples and they're good enough and I can draw blood by myself and I can do all the things by myself, I just do it in the room by myself with the client. Um, and I don't take them to the back until I have to or I need to. Um, so that's just me. Um, but everybody's a little bit different with their comfortability and what the pet will allow. And it's it's really dependent on your pet. Um, the next thing that I would say is if they are coming in for like an annual visit and they have to get like a fecal check. Um, or they need urine or something like that. I always tell people to bring the samples in. So bring in the uh, urine if you can bring in the urine. If you can get a free catch and put it in a container, bring it in. Um, you can also tell the veterinarian that you're going to be coming in. You want fecal cups and you want some um, urine cups, and they'll actually give you the cups. Um, and for cats, they'll give you like the little plastic litter so you can draw it up yourself and everything because um, it's kind of hard to get it from the cat, right? <laughs> but they'll yeah. give you the supplies to be able to collect it and they'll teach you how to collect it. Um, same thing with the dog. If you can bring their poop in and everything, that eliminates us having to go in and stick um, a loop in and draw out their stool or stick a finger in and pull out stool because yeah. um, that's what we do. If people don't know. It's really and it's abrasive and it's stressful. And just think about it. You came into a new you came into a place and you don't know what's going on. Somebody just randomly stick something up your back end and yeah. you're supposed to just like just do that. Right. That's it's, yeah. it's uncomfortable. They don't necessarily know what's going on. So. You know, I try to tell people collect whatever you can and bring it with you. That way we don't have to um, collect the things while they're there. Um, for me, I'm really big about ear thermometers um, or um, I can't. The contact thermometers don't really work on pets because they have that. They have the fur and feathers yeah. and things like that. So we can't really use those. Um, but what we can use is an ear thermometer. So um, I um, have my own ear thermometers and things like that when I go to hospitals. And that's what I use. Um, and it oh, took a while to get one that was accurate. <laughs> yeah. But um, I found a brand. It's called Braun, B-R-A-U-N. I know people are familiar with that brand, um, but it works really good with pets as well as humans. Um, if you're going to get temperatures and things like that at home, like you think your pet is sick, always have like a thermometer at home so you can check vitals and you know what the appropriate temperatures and things like that are for your pet. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I would say, you know, things like that. Fear free clinics tend to have stuff like that. Like they don't collect full stool samples. They'll tell you to bring it in with you. They don't like try. They try to do as little stressful, as little as the stressful things as we can, basically. Um, so yeah. that's that's what I would say, like, as far as preparation uh, for that appointment, those are the things that I would do. I would bring on their favorite treat or snack. Um, what else? Yeah. I mean, it's really all that you can do and just try to desensitize them to um, coming into the hospital and things like that. I know cats are really hard. Um, cats are just a whole nother ball game anyway. Um, yeah. But yeah, <laughs> uh, with the dog and cats trying to desensitize them is the best um, route to take. Yeah. And I was going to say too, like we tend to get upset over our dog's behavior when it's something that we don't like, like they snap or whatever. But if you think of it from their point of view, like, first of all, I hate going to the dentist and I know what the dentist is. Like I'm going there to prevent yeah. having teeth rot, right? Like I have that understanding of like the long term mm -hmm. and I'm, I still don't want to go get a cavity filled. Right. <laughs> um, from your dog's point of view, they have no idea why this is happening. Like, why are they sticking things up my butt? Why are they like doing this? Why are they touching my ear? Um, and so unless we're desensitizing them to let them mm -hmm. know that it's okay, like they have no idea. And so it is kind of understandable that a nervous mm -hmm. dog would snap and, I think it's just important to have that yep. compassion too. And having a vet that also has yep. that compassion. So um, mm -hmm. definitely find a fear free clinic, which by the way, do you know how people can yes. find a fear free clinic? <laughs> yes. So if you go to fearfree.com, um, veterinarians that are actually registered through fear free or they have staff that's trained under fear free. Um, it's something that we have to pay for. Um, like we have to pay to go through the, the course and the um, network and everything. So um, 
fearfree.com, I believe it is. Um, and you can go in, you type in your uh, zip code, and then it'll give you a list of clinics that are actually fear free. Um, but the other way that you can ask is um, you can call the clinic and you can just ask them like, hey, are y'all trained, trained in fear free and things like that? Because there's actually some fear free um, representatives that'll come out to clinics and they'll just do like free training and stuff like that. And they don't necessarily um, have, they didn't go through the program, but they came in and they did the training and everything. So that's also a, a oh, fear free fearfreepets.com. Thank you, Lisa. Um, no. So that's what that is, um, guys. So yeah, hop on there and check it out. Um, that's the other thing I would say. Um, it was something else I was going to note. Um, oh, whenever you have like puppies and kittens and um, like young animals, when they're young, trying to desensitize them to things is that yes. makes my job so much easier. So like mess with their tail, lift their tail, mess with their tail, Play with their feet, play with their face, look in their ears, mess with their ears, trim, play with their nails. Like that makes it so much easier when you want us to do like nail trims, clean their ears. If we have to go in and do an anal gland expression, if we have like it, it's it's so stressful on them whenever they like start fighting and they do all those things. Um, most veterinarians these days, like younger veterinarians, um, this is a little bit like old school school versus new school, but some old school doctors do it too. Um, they will actually give your pet like some medications to kind of de-stress them. Again, if you're more somebody that more so somebody that wants like the um, natural ap approach and you don't want to give them medications and things like that, desensitizing them to all the things is the way to combat that. So getting them started with, the, um, you know, the fear, the, the, touching the paws, the missing with the face, yeah. and all of that stuff. That's what desensitizes them so that we can be able to do things that we need to do a little bit easier. And I actually, so in my puppy course, just to <laughs> side note, I do have a whole fun. socialization checklist and handling checklist. Um, and I talk about, you know, cause it's not just about like touching their paws. It's making sure they also have a good experience with their paws touched. So, um, yeah. I use like classical conditioning. So like feeding them food while touching their paws lightly and then just looking mm -hmm. at their body language too. So like if you're touching their tail and they stop eating and they kind of like look back at you, that's too much. So like slowly working up to, you know, fully touching them and fully handling them, especially sensitive areas like their paws, tails, ears, muzzle, mm -hmm. things like that. Um, but yeah, I totally agree. So Thank you for saying that because I totally didn't explain it well. I kind of just ran over it, but yeah, exactly. Oh no, worries, no worries. <laughs> uh, and most people don't even do anything. So like, you know, it mm -hmm. is important. Critical socialization period ends at you know, every dog is different or every puppy is different, but like in general, like it is closed by 16 weeks. So yep. um, as much as you can, you know, making sure you get stuff in during the critical socialization period. And then of course, when they're adults, you can still desensitize them too, but just, you have to take it a little bit slower probably. It's, it's, it's harder. <laughs> uh, yeah. But yeah, but we could keep talking. I think we're already in at an hour and seven minutes. So <laughs> I could stay here like for like five hours and talk, but I don't know if people literally, <laughs> um, but I also need to take my dogs out to pee soon because they're like s staring at me. But oh, anyway, <laughs> um, so as we close out, um, any last things that you would like to mention? Anything? No, um, I would say if y'all do uh, want to find me, you can go on to bonkersaboutanimals.com. Um, that is my website. And the membership is up right now. Uh, Lisa has a special background uh, uh, link to my boot camp course. And all that, that is in the description. Be, so, yeah. Yeah. So, all that yeah. stuff is in the description. So, y'all can check that stuff out. But if you want to just do like the free side stuff, uh, free side of stuff too, like I have social media. I'm pretty much on every social media platform Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, um, Pinterest. It's all kinds of things. Um, I have a blog on my website as well where I kind of teach y'all like some DIYs and then I talk about like different medical conditions and things like that as well. So, uh, just go check that stuff out. And if you have questions again, um, definitely you can DM me on Instagram. Look at me learning lingo. You can talk to me on. Instagram, you talk to me on Facebook or any of the other platforms, and I am more than happy to answer whatever questions I can to the extent that I can, um, or I can refer you to somebody that can answer your question if I can't answer it. Cool. I'll definitely be sliding into your DMs next time I have a question. <laughs> cool. <laughs> well, thank you so much. Thanks for being here. Thanks for spending over an hour talking to us about how to proactively really care for our pets. And yeah, thank you. 
I'll talk to you later. All right, guys. Y'all have a good one. Have a good night. Bye.